Today's video is unique. We're looking at the scikit image library a little bit, image processing in Python so that we can do a CT simulation in Python. Now a CT scan, something that you would medically get done, is a way of taking a bunch of different x-rays from a bunch of different angles of somebody and combining them together to get a three-dimensional image. Now the algorithm by how you take those images and recombine them is not a simple one. And you can do it in Python for a few basic cases and that's sort of what I want to go over today. I think if you watch this video you'll get a really good understanding of how a CT scan works and how in practice we take data from CT scanners and use it to reconstruct three-dimensional images of the body. Please remember to like and subscribe as always and enjoy. So we have the regular two packages here of course numpy and matplotlib and then a few interesting ones we got scipy interpolate uh, this is one for interpolating sort of a, a two-dimensional image if you need to get information about what's going on between points in a 2d image and then uh, some stuff from scikit image as well by the way if uh, you see this video and you want a tutorial in scikit image do let me know because that's something i may consider in the future so there's something called the shep logan phantom this is just basically a 2d image as you'll see and then a few of the transform methods of scikit image as well so this video should serve as an interesting introduction to uh, the scikit image library of course scikit learn is a machine learning library of uh, scikit so we can import these packages and so what we're considering here is what's known as a computed tomography scan. And so the way this works in practice, from a very basic point of view, is when you take an x-ray of an object, right? You shine light, that's what x-rays are, it's light, only it's you know much more energetic than visible light. You shine light through an object, and some of it goes through and some of it doesn't. And in like a human body, you shine, it's almost like shining a flashlight at someone some of the light gets stopped by things like bones. It gets attenuated or absorbed and other times it sort of goes through. So you can take an x-ray of someone and you get a picture of the skeleton. But imagine you take an x-ray from a bunch of different angles, right? So you take maybe, you know, 20 different angled x-rays. So the question becomes, how do you use those to construct a three-dimensional image of the body to actually get three-dimensional data there? And there's a way of doing that. And this is what computed tomography essentially is. Here, for example, is a scanner uh, in two different positions. So the scanner's here. So you're scanning some sort of object in the center and the scanner's here. And the other case, the scanner's sort of here. So there's two different places where the scanner is. And so what happens is you have your scanner and you shine light sort of through that object. And then some of the light gets picked up by the scanner. Now, some of that light is gonna be absorbed or attenuated in the object and some of it's gonna go through. And maybe you don't know what's inside this object. You can see that it's sort of a black box. There might be bones and flesh or whatever, things that absorb light in different ways. So if there's a lot of bone in this area, a lot of this light will get absorbed and you'll have um, sort of less light going through. But if in the center it was maybe more air or water or something, maybe more of it goes through. And so less of it gets absorbed. But of course there's more also material here in the center. So maybe... Uh, you know, that also gets absorbed more. So depending on how it gets absorbed, what's in here, if there's like a big chunk of lead here, then none of the x-rays are going to go through sort of here. And then you get a profile here like this of the intensity of the light. And rather than considering the intensity sort of on its own, you can consider the natural logarithm of the original intensity that sort of you shine at the object divided by i. So i is always less than i naught because it's getting attenuated by the object to some degree. And the more it gets attenuated, the smaller i is, uh, the bigger this fraction is, and the bigger ln is. So this ln i naught over i increases as i decreases. So as more light gets absorbed in the object, this increases here. And so you can see the profile of ln i naught over i. So it's saying like if this was just a constant, you know, object of the same attenuation, you would get the most in the middle because they're the most material here. Whereas on this angle, of course, you're always shining it through the same sort of distance each time. And so the intensity profile kind of looks constant like this. Or rather not the intensity, but the logarithm of I naught, the original intensity divided by I. So in a sense, that's sort of how a two-dimensional x-ray works in this particular um, example. And so an object, essentially the main goal that we have here for this 
is there's an object with an unknown attenuation coefficient mu of x, y. This is a function of space and it's sort of what's inside here. So you tell me an x, y position and I'll tell you how strongly does light attenuate or how strongly does the material attenuate light at that point. Uh, so during scanning, the photons are sent through the object and the resulting intensity is picked up by a scanner, like I said. And it's known, this is like sort of a, a fact that I'm telling you in this video and you can derive this, that the intensity is equal to the initial intensity times the exponent of e to the minus and then you integrate mu over the area that you're interested in. So if mu is constant, it's e to the minus mu x. So it's exponentially decaying. So if I have a block of a constant material and I shine light through it, it says that light exponentially decays as I go through it. But if that material is composed of a bunch of different things, like you know the human body, for example, I have to integrate over all those different values of mu along the path. So ds is like along the path. So I'm integrating like light runs into one thing, it runs into another, it runs into another, and I'm taking the integral over all the different sort of areas to, to get the full attenuation here. And so ds is the particular, it's a straight line through the object as you shine the light through. Of course, it's more useful to write this. This is where I get the natural log of i naught over i equal to this integral. And so the quantity on the left, this can be measured. I put a scanner up and I can actually measure what i is, the intensity, and I can compute ln i naught over i. And of course, what we want to do is we want to solve for mu because if we know what the attenuation coefficient everywhere is, you can look at areas of higher attenuation coefficient, lower attenuation coefficient. These correspond to bone, muscle, whatever, all the different attenuation coefficients. When you look at a CT scan, the dark and light and all the shades, those are how strongly light is attenuated in those positions. That's exactly what you're looking at. And it so happens that that gives a pretty good image of the body and we can sort of um, discriminate different types of tissues and bones and whatever in the body just based on the attenuation coefficient alone. So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to call mu of x, y, f of x, y, because we're going to use it all the time. And f is just a nice symbol. And I'm going to call ln of i naught over i p of r theta. And you're wondering, well, what the heck are r and theta? That's really simple to define. So theta is the position of the scanner, right? A scanner at a different angle, right? That's like angle theta, how the scanner is oriented. And then R is the position when the scanner is in a position, how far you are from the center or to the left of the center position of the scanner. So for example, I could be at like 30 degrees, R is zero in the center, R is one, and then R is negative one. That's what P of R theta says. So it's a coordinate system that's defined basically in terms of the scanner position. So it's convenient then for the scanner. And so you give me a value of theta, like we adjust the machine, we get a value of theta. And then, you know, we measure an intensity profile in there. And I might have like, this is theta is 20 degrees, a particular thing. And I measure like r equals one, there's a lot of light here, r equals negative one, there's not as much light here. And so that's sort of what theta and r are in this problem. So like I say, theta measures the tilt of the scanner. So scanner one is at 90 degrees and scanner two is at theta is minus 45 degrees. So it's like, this is at 90 degrees, boom. This is at negative 45 degrees like this. And R specifies the horizontal location on the scanner. So if I have my scanner, just like, you know, built it in the lab, I have a scanner. R is like where I lie on that scanner. And so the goal here is we have a bunch of different values of theta that we take the scan angle from. And then we know R as well. So we know P of R theta for maybe a few different values of theta and, you know, probably lots of different values of R. How do you use P of R theta to get F of X, Y, which is the attenuation coefficient everywhere? This is what we measure and this is what we want to get. And it's not a trivial problem. So since we're doing this sort of as a simulation, I'm going to start with f of x, y. So I'm going to assume a, a particular attenuation coefficient everywhere in space. And then I'm going to use that to get p of r theta. And this is a good example to see how the scanner actually gets the particular um, image. And then we're going to look at techniques to reobtain f of x, y from p of r theta. So we use f to get p. And then of course the main purpose is how do we use P to get back F? Cause in practice, you don't know what F is. You only measure P in sort of a medical procedure. And so I'm going to create an image. Uh, it's just a 2d array 100 by hundred and it's all equal to one. Um, and then I'm going to uh, pad the image. So I have ones and then I pad it with zeros so that I get a square. So if I look at this image, I have my image is just a square in the center. So I create this 100 by 100 ray of all ones. And then I pad the sides here by sort of, you know, a bunch of empty space. So that's my image. 
And to make it a little more interesting, I'm gonna put a little circle inside the square that's equal to two. And so the way I do that is, well, first I create a mesh grid using the shape of the image. So creating a mesh grid, of course, is the X's and the Y's. I go over this in my basic sort of NumPy and Matplotlib tutorials, what a mesh grid means. And so in this particular area of the image that I've created, the square, there's a little circle. This is X squared plus Y squared or X minus, you know, the center of X and the center of Y squared is less than 0.01. So that's like the equation for a circle, everything that's inside that circle. And I'm setting that equal to two. And I can create rotated images as well. So I create my image here and then I create a rotated version of that image and I'm using the rotate function that I've imported from scikit image and I rotate it by 45 degrees and I want to show you sort of what that looks like. So here I'm going to plot the square with of course the little circle in it and also the rotation of the whole image and that's what I do here. So in summary I've created my image using ones I've padded the sides with zeros using this pad thing. And I pad it so that the diagonal sort of of that square is taken into account. Um, and then I create a little circle that sort of is equal to two as opposed to just equal to one. And I plot it. And so here's my square that I've initially created. And then this little circle, which is, you know, um, the center of the circle is 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, as you can see here. And it's equal to two. And then this is all equal to one. And then this is equal to zero. So of course, in terms of attenuation, it means that light goes through here and then it gets stopped here a little bit more than it does here. So this would be like almost like bone and then maybe this is uh, flesh or water or something in terms of a human scan. And then I can rotate this image here. And so rather than rotating the scanner in this example, the scanner is going to be in the same position. And when we simulate this, all we're going to do is we're going to rotate the image and it wrote it simulates rotating the scanner as well. That's just an easier way of doing this. So my image and my rotated image. Now what I want to do is I want to simulate getting a bunch of different scans for a bunch of different values of theta. So I'm going to create a bunch of different rotations of this image. And so I create, uh, you know, from zero to 180 every five degrees. And I'm doing this in terms of um, radians here. So I'm converting to radians by multiplying by pi divided by 180. And then my R's is equal to the value here, which is just negative one to one. A bunch of different values there and uh, d theta is the difference between the thetas in the array and what i do is i create a bunch of different rotations so what i do is using list comprehension i rotate the image by theta in um, radians here convert it to two degrees because this rotate function needs it in degrees and i do this for all the different values of theta that i have so five degrees ten degrees uh, 15, 20, 25, 30, all those. And I get a bunch of different rotations of my images. And so for example, rotations is just an array of a bunch of different 2D arrays. So for example, if I take rotations two and I plot this, you can see one of the possible rotations here. And then rotations three, it's rotated a little more, a little more, and these are five degree segments. So I have all my different rotated images. And if I wanna know what the scanner measures, the ln of i over i naught. Remember that I have to integrate this over my image in a straight line as it goes to the scanner. So what that means is if I have my rotated image like this, I just have to sum along this particular axis. And if I sum this together, which is equivalent is this discrete version of the integral of mu ds over a particular sort of projection into the scanner. I get P of R theta for that particular value of theta. So this corresponds to a particular value of theta. And then R equals zero is in the center, the two variables I talked about. And as I go right or left, I get my different value of R for that particular scanner. So my images rotate, rather than rotating the scanner around the image, I just rotate the image. It effectively does the same thing. And then I can sum along that image to get P of R theta. Theta is already set and R is sort of the distance to the center of that image. So I can define P of R theta. I have all my different rotations and I need to sum along this axis. So I'm like summing, you know, all these together, all these together, summing along columns, I guess you could say, or summing along rows would be the proper thing, but I'm summing down like this. So all these get summed together. And if this is like at R equal, if this is R equals zero, I would sum sort of down the center here. R equals negative one, I would sum, sum sort of down here. All those different values of R. I can get P of R uh, theta. So there's, um, 180 divided by five, which is like 30 something different values of theta. 
and I need to sum about the vertical axis here. And so what I do is I take my rotation, I have all my different rotations, I sum it along axis equals zero, so I'm summing along sort of this direction here, and I'm doing it for all the different rotations I have, and that gives me P of R theta. So if I look at P, P is now a two dimensional array because there's a value of R and these each correspond to a particular value of theta, right? So I can plot, for example, a particular angle. So here I'm choosing the fourth angle here, which is it's five degrees, so five, 10, 15, 20. So this is the sort of projection at angle 20 degrees and I'm gonna look at it as a function of the R's here. And so this is sort of what you get. In fact, it might be easier to look at the uh, theta equals zero first. And you can see that, remember I have a square with a little circle. So let's look at how this corresponds to this. So remember I'm summing along this direction here. And so I'll get sort of a projection of this image along this axis. And that's what this is here. And so this means that it's attenuated more, this is attenuated a bit less, and then it's sort of constant like this. So at the scanner sort of aligned with the square, I get something that looks like this. And as I rotate my image more and more, it starts to sort of widen out in weird ways. And I sort of get all these different projections of my image at these different angles. So, so I'm summing the image together and I'm projecting it along these different planes. That's sort of what a, a X-ray or CT scan does. So I have all these different projections and I wanna use all those projections, which is P of R theta, to compute F of XY. Uh, so rather than looking at it just for a particular angle, I can also plot the 2D array. And this is called the sinogram when we do this. So I'm gonna plot the sinogram, I'm gonna do it for all different values of thetas and Rs, and I'm gonna look at P. And you'll see why it's called a sinogram, because it almost kind of looks like a sine curve. So when you have like a point, the point becomes a sine wave on this diagram when you compute a sinogram. So this is known as the sinogram of the image. This is what you measure when you're taking a medical image of a patient. This is the raw data. And you wanna use this to reconstruct this square with a circle in it, or in the case of a patient, something obviously much more complicated. So there's a few ways to think about how to get from P back to F. And the first method, which is sort of the intuitive way of doing this, when you think about it a little bit, is called back projection. And so you'll note that for a scan at angle theta, there's only one value of R that XY contributes to. And I said that fast and maybe that doesn't make sense and I'll go up to the diagram here to show what I mean. So here's my um, thing, and this is at a particular value of theta, so the scanner is sort of aligned like this. And if I take a point x, y here, and the light's sort of coming downward through this image, that point x, y only contributes to a particular r on this image. So if I'm at this point here, that only contributes to this value of r. And this other point x, y, well, this only contributes to this value of r. So at each value of theta, x, y, a particular point on the image only corresponds to one of the values of R for that particular scan. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying that for value of R, that particular point is equal to R is equal to X cos theta plus Y sine theta. So this value here of R, say this point here, if I take X cos theta plus Y sine theta, I get this value here and that's R and that's the distance from the center. So it only corresponds to that particular point. So the idea is, well, why don't we take that point and we'll sum all the different, because there's a bunch of different values of theta, we're gonna sum them all together and we're gonna get F that way. So, you know, in this particular scan, I'm gonna go to this diagram here. This point corresponds to this value of R, but that same point here corresponds to this value of R. So if I measure a lot here and I measure a lot here, I sum them together then I get sort of like uh, I'm, I'm adding things together so that, you know, the more that I get from all these different points, the larger that value is going to be. So we take all those values of R for all the different projections that we're interested in that XY corresponds to and we sum them together. And that's how we get a particular value of XY or at least an estimate of what's going on at that point. You'll see that it's not actually quite this value. And so, of course, this can be approximated as the discrete sum here. And so what we need is we need a way of getting what P is at X cos theta plus Y sine theta so we can sum them all together. And so that's where I use this interpolation function. This gives me the interp of P. So P is a 2D array. P interp is a function. So I give any value of X, Y I want and it will tell me what's the value of P at that location. So I use my 2D array and then I also have the R's and theta's values. 
and I can define my back projection. And that's what whatever the value of P is at X cos theta plus Y sine theta. Uh, undo that. And for all my different values of theta, and then I sum them together. And of course, multiply by D theta. So this is essentially just an integral. The dot sum is like integrating over all these different values, multiplying by D theta. And then I can sort of, you know, I want to do this for all different values of X and Y. So I vectorize this function so I can give in a 2D array, XV and YV. And then I get my FBP, which is going to be a 2D array, the filtered back projection. And I can plot the filtered back projection now. And it looks like this. And you can see that it's sort of blurry, but it does a decent job of reconstructing what the original image looks like. But it turns out that FBP is not the true value of F. It's the intuitive way of doing it, but it's not actually what's going on. So this leads to what's known as filtered back projection, and it makes use of Fourier information. And so this is heavily mathematical, and I'll go over it quickly, but I encourage you, especially those of you who are interested, to sit and read it and really digest what's going on here. So a 2D function has the following Fourier transform. This is just a fact. F, capital F, the Fourier transform, there's a X frequency and a Y frequency, and it's the integral of f of x, y, and then I have these two sort of exponential terms. It's like a 1D Fourier transform, except with two different components here. Uh, P of r theta has a 1D Fourier transform. Well, theta is just a constant. It's just a particular scanner angle. But I take the Fourier transform in r. And so the frequency is uh, v, or mu, or whatever the hell it's called here. That's the integral of P of r theta. It's just a regular Fourier transform that you sort of see here. And of course, theta is the angle of the scanner. I can do this for all different angles of the scanner and get a 1D Fourier transform of each of these functions right here. Now, my capital F, if I plug in V cos theta, V sine theta to these particular frequencies here, I get the following function like this. And this is something that we're going to do that I'm going to prove something. So I'm, I'm doing this conveniently. So I'm saying, let's take the an, uh, angle of the scanner and V, we'll call this V. We're plugging this in to get something that looks like this. Then I'll let R equal X cos theta plus Y sine theta. So you'll see that R will sort of get absorbed in here. That's the equation for the line that moves parallel to the scanner direction when changing R. And if the parallel line is that, then the anti-parallel line, the perpendicular line, is a minus sign in front of here. So that's T. That's the line perpendicular to there. And so that tells me that f of v cos theta, v sine theta, again, read this slowly if you're really interested. I plug this in. Um, of course, x cos theta plus y sine theta, that turns into r here. And I in, it turns out that I integrate this, f of x, y, dt. Well, that's just equal to p, and that's equal to p of v theta. So again, read this math slowly. You're not going to understand it just from me explaining in the video. But it tells you that this is equal to this. So the Fourier transform of f of x, y is related to the 1D Fourier transform of the radon function. So 2D transform of this related to the 1D transform of radon function. So this is the main result here. Again, I would read through this slowly if you're interested, but this is sort of the interesting fact that my 2D Fourier transform of the thing that I'm interested in is related to the Fourier transform of the thing that I can measure. So I can measure something, take a Fourier transform. It tells me something about the Fourier transform of what I want to get, and then I can inverse Fourier transform that. And so there's a little bit more math here. I'm not going to go into this, but the main result that you end up is with that f of x, y is equal to this integral d theta p prime of this. So it sort of looks like the formula that I had uh, with the regular back projection. Here, only I have a p prime. And so the difference is that p prime is this filtered Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform of capital P. So if this absolute value wasn't here, this would just be like what P is equal to. So I'm taking the Fourier transform of P. I filter it using this filter here, V. So it's related to the sort of absolute value of the spatial frequency. And um, the inverse Fourier transform that. So I'm filtering P. The data that I get, I filter it, and then it's related to f of x, y using this formula. So we'll do a little bit of stuff with Fourier transform. I import my Fourier transform stuff from SciPy. Of course, I have a whole video on doing stuff like this, and uh, I just say get stuff here. So here I'm taking the Fourier transform of little p, 
for all the different values of theta. So I'm doing it for each value of theta. So that P is a 2D array, but I'm just saying do it for each of the 1D arrays. So this is a 1D Fourier transform done sort of many, many times on the rows of this 2D array. And then these are my frequencies, which of course I use the frequency function. Again, this is all discussed in my Fourier transform video. So I get P and nu. And uh, then what I need to do, of course, is I need to filter this capital P, which is the Fourier transform. In order to do that, I take P and I transpose it because it's convenient here and I multiply by the absolute value of nu. That's what this is equal to, the capital P times the absolute value of nu here. So that's the filtered function. So I'm getting the filter function, right? That's my integrand. That's sort of this value here. It's actually not including this. So it's just this value here. And then I take the inverse Fourier transform of it and then only take the real values because of course, sometimes with a little bit of computational um, uh, lack of precision, you get small complex components. I just want the real value. So I'm taking the inverse Fourier transform of this here with the absolute value. So here I filter it like this and then I take the inverse Fourier transform and I do it for all the different values of theta. So now I have P prime. So P underscore P, that's P prime here. Then I need to use P prime, integrate it like this to get F of X, Y. So I can look at P prime. Well, it's not really interesting. And then I do the same thing. I have P prime. So that's a function of 2D space. And I interpolate it, right? Like before, because in order to compute uh, this integral here, I need to be able to get values at X cos phi and Y sine phi. So that's not really on the rectangular grid like it was before. So I interpolate it and then I do the same thing before. This is get f using a similar function, only I'm using p prime interp instead of p interp. And then I do it for all the different values of x and y and I can get f of x, y. And I need to define this. And when I plot this, you can see that I get a better estimate. So it turns out this is a better estimate of the image. It might look sort of weird what's going on here. And you can see that I have these sort of artifacts here, but I do get a better resolution of the square that I have and then also the circle as well. Okay, so I realized there was a little bug um, up here when computing um, P. You have to make sure to multiply by dr. That ensures that you're actually computing an integral when you sum along that axis. So there's a little bit of a scaling issue. So just remember there's a dr. And when you look at the code, this will be there as well. Uh, anyways, so you go through all this. Um, you compute uh, the integrand. Um, you take the filter here, which is what we're doing here. We compute the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, we do some interpolation and we get this estimate of our image. Now, it's obviously not a perfect estimate. And you can see that there are certain uh, things here. And it turns out when you actually take CT scans, these like artifact like things, uh, when you don't do advanced correction techniques, these will show up. So this is a common um, artifact of taking sort of CT scans. But you can see that we have decent resolution. It's not as blurred as before with regular back projection. And you can see that clearly there's the square here and the circle here. And if you know how to interpret these images, you know that like lines like this or things like this are probably artifacts of the actual imaging um, uh, procedure. And so we can look at like a, a given projection here, right? For example, I can look at this line, the intensity, and I just, you know, plot a sample here and I can see that indeed, um, you know, it's not perfect. It says that it's equal to one here. We know that it should be equal to zero. And then you got this like, projection here and then it's sort of a value here. So it's, it's really not perfect. And now this theorem here, you could think, okay, I can reconstruct f of x and y perfectly. Well, notice that I have to integrate over infinitely many different values of, well, in this case it's phi, but in our case, it's the uh, angle of the scanner. They're the same variable. So we only have finitely many angles of the scanner. So the profound thing about this, what it's saying here is that if you measure someone from infinitely many different scanner positions, right? You, you, you do like really, really small changes in the scanner before you take a scan. You can perfectly reconstruct someone. But of course, when you're taking a real scan, there just isn't enough time to take a, a new scan for every different little angle. And so that's not really possible. So we're doing an approximation of theta. And really, we're only using like five degree segments. So we're really not doing a continuous integral here whatsoever. So this holds for infinitely many values of 
theta or infinitely many scan angles, but that's not what we have here. So we don't get that and we get an approximation of our image. Now I've shown sort of the math and how to do this and it's really easy with the scikit image libraries. So there's something called radon and iRadon that will compute the sinogram, which is what we took a while to do. And it can take a sinogram and get a real image with the iRadon function. So I can import these libraries and I'll do the same thing as before. Well, actually it's easier. I don't need to rotate my image or do anything like that. I need to specify the angles theta of the scanner. So I have, um, in fact, it's easier to write it like this. The same angles as before in five degree segments. Um, this is not an argument for a range. And I get my sinogram here. And this, you know, everything that we did before um, leading up to this point here is done in a one line of code. So that's what's really nice about scikit image. You can do that really fast. I get my sinogram and I can plot it and we get the same plot as before. And now, of course, this is what you measure in an actual experiment. Uh, these are the angles theta, sort of discrete like that. And so this is everything that you would measure when you're doing a real scan. And so maybe you collect some data and then you say, well, I wanna see what the image looks like. Well, for that, you have the iRadon function. So I have my sinogram, theta equals theta, and I'm using filter ramp. What ramp means, and that's the default value, that's uh, this value here, so absolute value of new. If I didn't have that here, it's just no filter whatsoever. That's regular back projection that we did up here to get this estimate. But the ramp filter uses this, and this is what's shown to really get f of x, y. So uh, if you have infinitely many values of scan angles, which we don't, it's a pro an approximation. So I can give uh, the ramp filter here, and I can reconstruct the image. And as you can see, we get the exact same thing as before, only we've used the library. And I can, again, I can look at a given angle here and you can see again, it doesn't reconstruct it perfectly outside. It is equal to one, should be equal to zero because nothing's happening at all. And then you get the center point here as well. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial video. I hope it exposes what imaging is like in Python and some of the scikit image libraries and also how CT scanning works. Because I don't know about you, but before I learned this stuff, and this is what I'm sort of doing in my PhD, I had no idea how an image of the body was taken. I probably had a, a, a little idea of how an x-ray worked and things like that, but this kind of stuff, no idea. And the mathematics behind this is really, really cool. So if you're interested, definitely look more into it. And let me know if you want to see more imaging videos.